In this video, we will be looking at how an electronic expansion valve, or EEV, works in an HVAC system. We'll also cover some common issues and how to troubleshoot them. We will be looking at unipolar EEVs, which we usually see in HVAC applications. These are a bit different from the bipolar EEVs we see in commercial refrigeration applications, and we won't be covering those in this video. Like a thermostatic expansion valve, or TXV, an EEV is a metering device. It drops the pressure of liquid refrigerant. Unlike older fixed orifice metering devices, both TXVs and EEVs can modulate their orifice size to set a constant superheat. They're more common in VRV or VRF systems, mini splits, and variable speed systems. A TXV is a mechanical device that modulates when different sources of pressure are applied to the valve. The bulb exerts pressure when the fluid inside of it expands or contracts along with the suction line temperature. The same is true of the spring and the external equalizer on systems that have those. Systems that use EEVs don't rely on pressures to modulate the valve. Instead, a printed circuit board, or PCB, collects data from sensors on both entering and leaving refrigerant lines of the heat exchanger, essentially measuring refrigerant before and after expansion, or condensing depending upon the mode. The sensors tell the controller what's happening in the system and how the EEV will need to respond to maintain the set conditions. This gives us precise control of the refrigerant flow into the heat exchanger and allows us to respond quickly to changes. The controller sends out an electrical signal to the EEV, energizing windings to create a magnetic field that modulates the internal components of the valve. These signals are called pulses. These pulses determine how many turns the internal pin rotates inside the valve, causing the internal needle to raise or lower to allow more or less refrigerant flow through the valve. Even among EEVs, there is some variation in the way they modulate because there are several different versions you will find in field installed equipment. The first type of EEV uses a stepper motor. These EEVs have a ring that goes around the top of the valve and has offset windings with iron points that look like teeth. These windings take in electrical signals and magnetize the iron points which help rotate a magnet connected to the inner rotor, which moves up and down with clockwise and counterclockwise rotation. These EEVs have a permanent magnet inside an aluminum shell connected to the pin assembly. This magnet has a set number of north and south poles that attract or repel when the electrical current alternates through the windings in the motor. When current alternates, poles that were once attracted will start repelling each other and vice versa. The cycle of attracting and repelling creates rotation, allowing the stepper motor to drive the pin assembly whenever electrical voltage is applied. This voltage varies by manufacturer, but is usually between 5 and 12 volts of direct current. The power head has four copper coils or motor windings surrounded by sets of iron points or teeth which concentrate the magnetism in specific areas that allow the motor to turn with precision. Each winding has a dedicated wire. There will also be one or two common wires depending upon the model. Pulses from the board tell the EEV how much it needs to turn to raise or lower the pin. These pulses energize the windings in the coils 
which magnetize the iron teeth and assign a north and south polarity. When the voltage is applied in a specific sequence, the polarity of the north and south teeth change and generate a rotational electromagnetic field. This electromagnetism is what drives the EEV and the pin to control the flow of refrigerant through it. It takes 480 pulses for the valve to fully open or fully close. You'll often see these at the outdoor unit in mini splits and also VRF equipment. The short liquid line brings warm, high pressure liquid into the EEV and it exits the valve as a low pressure liquid slurry, which travels to the evaporator via the expansion line. The second type of EEV uses a direct drive motor instead of an indirect stepper motor. It's sometimes referred to as a gear driven expansion valve. This type of EEV has a larger power head that contains more parts, including a threaded connection and gasket to attach the valve body. A solid connection allows a small pin inside the head to push down onto a spring, which can raise or lower the pin position inside the valve. It also contains four sets of coils, which each surround a permanent magnet and connect to four coil wires. And at least one set of coils will have an additional common wire. These coils have offset teeth, which helps them change polarity when voltage is applied. The permanent magnet has a set number of north and south poles, as well as a central gear which rotates among a set of seven or eight other gears that turn together to move the pin up and down. As with the EEV with an indirect motor, a direct drive requires voltage to be applied in a specific sequence to change the polarity of the north and south poles. The force generated will turn the gears, which raise and lower the pin. The larger the number of gears, the higher the amount of torque we can create to turn the main insertion pin. The gears cause the electrical pulses to create smaller adjustments than the stepper motor, so it takes significantly more pulses to open or close the valve fully. For this EEV, it takes 2,000, but some EEVs have a range from 0 to 3,000 or even 6,000 pulses. A higher number of pulses gives you more precise control of the valve, since there are more steps for the pin to take between fully open and fully closed. Unlike indirect drive EEVs, direct drives are more common in indoor units, especially in VRV and VRF systems. EEVs of both types have similar common fail points. As with mechanical metering devices like TXVs, the pin may get mechanically stuck. One of the most common failures is a failed coil. The first thing to do is to perform a resistance test with your ohmmeter. But first, make sure you disconnect power from the unit. Then, remove the EEV plug from the PCB. Check the resistance between each coil wire and its respective common wire. If you don't know which wires are which, consult the manufacturer's literature. The manual will also have the resistance you can expect. In this case, we have one red common wire and a normal resistance reading is 45 ohms plus or minus 10%. A low resistance value indicates that the winding has degraded. You will need to replace the valve. The same goes for an open or OL reading. When you've ruled out electrical problems, you can see if the valve is stuck from a mechanical issue. The way to do this is to make sure the valve can fully open and fully close. You can do this using a hand-powered cylindrical tool with magnets called a manual actuator or tool like the EEV Mate. If you use a manual actuator, you'll remove the power head and replace it with the actuator. You should perform slow rotations and feel a little bit of pull as you do so. Make sure the pin can fully open and close. 
If you feel no pulling or the pin doesn't move, you can be sure you have a problem with the valve body. The EEV mate requires you to seat the power head on the valve but unplug it from the PCB. It will plug into the EEV mate which has a step counter. You will then drive the valve manually using the EEV mate tool. If your valve has a maximum range of 480 steps, we want to drive the valve 480 pulses on the EEV mate. Confirmation of the valve closing or opening can be confirmed while the system is operating in either mode by measuring the temperature both entering and exiting the valve. Electronic expansion valves have unique structures and diagnostic considerations, but they respond quickly to information from the system faster than your typical TXV. They also give us more precise control over refrigerant flow than fixed orifice or mechanical metering devices, which is why we see them in high efficiency systems and will likely see more of them in years to come. Huge thanks to Roman Ball and JD Kelly who have made videos, tech tips, and diagrams about EEV usage. You can find the link to JD's tech tip about troubleshooting EEVs in the description. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.